Now, uh, just a quick round of applause for all of the people who have presented so beautifully. A beautiful introduction in the first half of our program about the things that divide us, that define us, and that unite us among all of our faith traditions. And, and now, the second half of the program, what can we do about the world? How do we do tikkun olam? How do we heal the world? How do we dig our neighbors out from earthquakes and, and, um, and do all of the things that we're supposed to do? Now, interestingly enough, there is a organization called the United Nations that has come up with something called the Millennium Development Goals. And these Millennium Development Goals very specifically say we need to wipe out poverty. We need to wipe out gender inequity. We need to wipe out uh, the, the lack of, of literacy throughout the world because we all know that education is the path to a better world for everybody. We need to cure the sick. We need to, uh, to feed the hungry. We need to work together as faith communities. And those actually are the Millennium Development Goals as defined by the United Nations. And joining us today to, to introduce them and speak a little bit more on the subject is Sarah Hildebrandt, who is the founder and director of Millennium Kids. Uh, she is a former lawyer, to, lawyer with the uh, Ministry of the Attorney General, and she has basically dedicated her life to her passion for justice and reaching out to others. So, Sarah? Good evening. I've had the privilege of coordinating the 2010-2011 Interfaith Millennium Development Goal Events Initiative for the Canadian Interfaith Partnership, headed by uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Karen Hamilton. And I'm deeply grateful to Imam Salimi and Imam Patel for the involvement of themselves and the Muslim community in engaging in this project over the last year. Diverse communities have gathered together across the country to learn more about the United Nations Millennium Development Goals and to speak to each other and to governments, encouraging each other to deepen our commitments to the Millennium Development Goals. There is a G8 Religious Leaders Summit that occurs annually and brings together faith leaders from around the world at a summit. I recently returned from the France Summit where religious leaders drafted an inspired statement to give to the faith, to give to the political leaders of the G8 countries, just in advance of the G8 summit, encouraging them to take the bold action that's now needed to fulfill the Millennium Development Goals. There's great strength in the work that's been done through the coordinated efforts of those who, communities that have been involved in the Millennium Development Goal Interfaith Project. Muslims and Jews, Hindus, Baha'is, Christians, Sikhs, Buddhists, and First Nations peoples. Thank you to each of these communities for engaging. Please don't stop. The Millennium Development Goals are on a card that you have at your tables there in front of you. They are eight incredible goals that will transform the world when we fulfill them. The first, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. Number two, achieve universal primary education. Three, promote gender equality and empower women. Four, reduce child mortality. Five, improve maternal health. Six, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. Seven, ensure environmental sustainability. And eight, create a global partnership for development. These goals were signed in the year 2000 by 192 countries to be completed by the year 2015. Bold goals. 192 countries pledged to spare no effort to fulfill these goals. And each goal has some measurable targets so we can be sure we meet them. For goal number one, we have together pledged to reduce by one half the number of people living on less than one dollar a day worldwide by 2015. There are currently over a billion people living in extreme poverty a day. For MDG number five, we have collectively promised to reduce by three quarters the number of women dying in childbirth and pregnancy related complications. This number is currently more than a half million women a year and exceeds the total number of people who die annually from HIV AIDS related diseases. 
When I first learned of the MDGs, I was convinced that if Canadians knew about these goals that we had committed to in 2000, and knew about the potential for global partnership, that we would press our government to honour our UN commitment, and that they would represent our hearts, the hearts of people of faith in living in extreme poverty. We are also engaging and mobilizing youth around the Millennium Development Goals. Millennium kids are celebrating a good start and inspiring a great finish to the MDGs. The spokeschildren for this movement, Millennium Kids, are children who were born in the same year that we committed to the MDGs, the year 2000. Look for our public service announcements on national television networks. Youth will be gathering in a Toronto stadium to hear inspired stories of hope and transformation in the developing world and to renew our global call to action. We're launching an iTunes download and be counted campaign to measure and present the groundswell of public support for the MDGs that is now mounting. Please download and be counted at millenniumkids.ca, another way you can be involved in promoting these goals. Canada has fallen grossly behind and the world is not on track to meet the goals. Just over 50% of the targets have been reached. But there are four years left. If not people of faith, then who? Will we think creatively and generously and challenge our government to act now? In the MDGs, we find beautifully shocking language and political commitment that articulates the hearts of people of faith for a world free from injustice, and poverty. In my own uh, faith tradition, there's a sacred text that uh, writes the following. This is the kind of fast I'm after, to break the chains of injustice, get rid of exploitation in the workplace, free the oppressed, cancel debts. When I'm in, what I'm interested in seeing you do is this, sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on shivering ill-clad, and being available to your own families. Do this, and the lights will turn on. Let's continue to speak and act for the Millennium Development Goals together. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I, I can't actually think of a better, more organized way to approach all of the ills that are, that are troubling our world than, than that simple commitment to, to uh, follow those goals. And I know the Faith of Life Network uh, were one of the initial sponsors when Dr. Hildebrandt came up to introduce those goals, goodness me, five years ago now, because it's something that can draw us all together. So I would like to invite up then Dr. Uh, uh, and Imam Abdul Hai Patel. Uh, he is the chair of the Ontario Multi-Faith Council to talk about this, this concept of interfaith cooperation, which is so central to the Millennium Development Goals. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone. I'm really honored and privileged to be part of this uh, blessed gathering of bringing the faith together. And it is really a reflection of our new Canada, where faith communities come together. About three years ago or so or more, Tony Blair, the former British Prime Minister, came to this country to mobilize the faith communities for, the, for eradicating malaria in uh, Africa. And he called, uh, he invited a number of faith leaders when he started speaking, he understood that we knew each other. This is nothing new to Canada. It was new maybe in England or in other countries, but he was quite surprised that we had about 30 faiths sitting together at one table, and they were talking to each other. So he says, I didn't know that such a cooperation existed here. These were his words. So we have been engaged for a number of years as Canadians, and. We are challenged right now to come together for the cause of making life better and more secure in Canada by working together for the cause of social justice and for security in this country, at the same time creating an understanding of different faiths so that we can teach our young children who will be adults tomorrow the respect that is needed for other faith communities. 
the latest stati st uh, Statistics Canada report come out on hate crimes is, and the top of the list are three communities, Jewish community, Muslim community, and the Arab community, not to overlook the other racial minorities as well. This is a sad commentary on our society, but it is something that we are challenged. We at Ontario Multiface Council, which is the largest multi-faith body in the country, we have 30 faiths on our board, and our mandate given by the Ontario government is to ensure access to spiritual and religious care in all institutions, government institutions that is. And at the moment, since I've been a president for the past three years, currently the first cut that is coming in the health care and other uh, ministries is on chaplaincy. Faith communities now are challenged to come together. We have an election coming, I'm not making a political commentary, but it is something that faith communities should be concerned about, that we have to come together to save the office of the chaplaincy that has been an institution in this country for many years in our healthcare facilities and correctional facilities. That would be the next. So this is something that I would like to remind all of us that yes, Ontario Multi-Faith Council, with 30 faiths on our board, some of our board members are here at the moment, uh, and we are committed to ensure this access, but that will only come about with the support of all the faith communities. This is where we have to understand what is the value of interfaith in Canadian context today, is to come together in gathering like this and the interfaith partnership that we just heard for the other, for the universal protection of the Millennium Development Goal, and also for this country, how we can make life better for each other. Thank you. He is my dear friend, what I consider a small but potent imam, and uh, also the interfaith coordinator for the Canadian Council of Imams, something I should have mentioned uh, at the beginning. I would next like to invite up Mr. Giovanni Ricciatelli. Uh, and, and I just, forgive me, I can't help trying to roll this off my tongue, from the Unione Cristiana Enti Tra I Per I Migranti Italiani. Uh, basically to represent, how did I do? <laughs> basically to represent the Catholic community um, and, and the legacy that stretches all the way back to, I think, Pope John Paul II for, for feeding the poor and, and healing the sick. So thank you. Uh, Salam alaikum to all of you, dear friends, brother and sister. It's both a, an honor and a privilege to be with you tonight in this Fate of Life's fifth annual interfaith evening. My name is uh, Giovanni Riccitelli, and uh, I am the president of Bucemi, a lay organization which gathers together all the Catholics of Italian origin. Our organization draws inspiration from uh, humane and Christian principle with uh, particular regards to those of uh, human dignity, brotherhood, justice, and social solidarity. Uchemi, our organization, favors reconciliation, concrete updating and renewal, communication structures, and permanent dialogues, real involvement in the Canadian church, and uh, the carrying out of fraternity, always more ecumenical. Dialogue for us is always possible when there is an open faith an optimistic confidence and trust in God. Islam, Christianity, or any other religion, we believe, are only direction in life. No religion is to take God's place. That is, the place of that love which is bigger than us and of the pinnacle of all religions put together. We believe, anyway, that the religious pluralism today enriches our community. Last October, in the Hall of the Church of St. James Francis in Toronto, we launched the interreligious dialogue, dialogue between uh, Catholics and Muslims. Between others, we had the honor to have uh, a really welcomed guest, the Imam, Dr. Amit Slimi, 
a minister, a scholar, who is even the chairman of the Canadian Council of Imams, and also is a constant presence in ever interfaith dialogue. Dr. Slimi, you know, speaks fluent Arabic, French, English, but you will not believe it. This humble person, on that occasion, forced himself to speak in Italian. Yes, in Italian. It's something, something which was very much appreciated by the Italian community, which uh, was conquered by him and by his speech. I remember that in that occasion he said, justice is more important than prayers. And also I remember that uh, he praised Catholic uh, charity, Mother Teresa, humility, the love that comes from the heart, and even he praised the humility of the Christian monks and priests mentioned in the Quran, in chapter 5th. Sorry, I lost my, my, my paper. Okay, so we were very impressed by, by him, and uh, you are very uh, blessed that is it with your community. And uh, we want to continue on the dialogue, and uh, next Sunday we have uh, a concert in honor of uh, John Paul II, and uh, we invited the, the Imam and uh, he will come, he will be present for the, the event. And uh, we are very glad. Also, he write a message, a very beautiful message that from the one famous opera house in Venice, in Italy. And uh, so hopefully we enjoy, we remember the figures on uh, John Paul II that did something to, to unite us. And, uh, and this is, so, if you want to, to come to this event, uh, come to my table and uh, I will give you the ticket. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. I, I have to admit, Mother Teresa has always been an inspiration to me as well because she was a woman who, if you read uh, the book, they collected her diary and they, they published it as a book. And this woman dedicated her life to the service of others even though she was not sure there was a reward waiting for her in heaven. She wasn't sure she believed any of this, but she dedicated her life to acting as if it were true because she knew that was the right thing to do and the best thing to do. Now next I'd like to invite up Dr. Jeffrey Brown, uh, who is a representative of the, of the Unitarian uh, Congregation of Peel Region, uh, to, to share with us the, the Unitarian perspective, because they're, they're a Christian church with, with a very broad definition of doctrines and faiths and beliefs, and I think an excellent place to go after, after praising Mother Teresa and, and the incredible work that she did. So, Dr. Brown? I bring you greetings from the Unitarian congregation in Mississauga this evening. Uh, I'll, I'll correct David a little bit in that we're a non-creedal uh, tradition, and in that context are not Christian, where other than Christian have Christians who are part of the congregation, part of the movement, but not necessarily uh, encompassing that. Uh, we actually celebrate the diversity of belief both within our, uh, our communities as well as the diversity that is here this afternoon, this evening, uh, that we start, that we need not think and believe alike in order to love one another, whatever our orientation. I also want to give, bring greetings this evening on behalf of the 905 area faith community leaders. This is the primary multi-faith body in, uh, in Mississauga, in Peel to a certain extent. We occasionally reach up to Brampton. We would like to do more of that, in fact. Uh, we 
have been an active group for some number of years now, approximately 15 or so, and I've had the honor of chairing it for the last eight years. I want to just share with you the purpose of the 905 Area Faith Community Leaders, and it is to strengthen the voices of faith to promote compassion, justice, and the common good through dialogue, learning, and action by cultivating relationships among faith communities and their leaders and engaging other leaders and groups in our society to see that justice is done. I would encourage those of you who may not be participants in the body, in this group, to join with us. We welcome all and we have a very inclusive notion of what leadership within faith communities is all about. That includes all of us. And so with that, I'm delighted that we're all here tonight. I thank uh, Imam Slimi. I'm delighted to follow my good friend Abdul Hai. Uh, and I'm just delighted that we have this opportunity. Reverend Brown, I learned something. My, my sole understanding of Unitarianism was actually from my next door neighbor. And that's the great thing about this sort of dialogue is, is the, the learning actually never ends. And it's, it's, it's a pleasure. I would next like to invite up Imam Dr. Hamid Slimi uh, to make a presentation. He is a man that I have known, uh, we went on Hajj about six years ago. And uh, he's fluent in even more languages than, than Giovanni told you. He's also fluent in Hebrew. And he is a man who is the chair of the Canadian Council of Imams and one of the most respected Muslim scholars in North America. And, and one of the most uh, dedicated to, to outreach and, and serving all people and, and, and building bridges to all people and, and a man whose vision has basically inspired the entire Faith of Life network and, and created everything that we are. So, Imam Slimi. Thank you, David. Again, peace be with you. And uh, as you said, we have learned a lot of things. There are a few things that were mentioned between the lines. We take it for granted that we know everything about each other, but we realize that we don't know much. And uh, uh, it's very important to understand that none of us is perfect, and we're humans, and only God who is perfect. That I think that's something we all can agree on, that God is the only one who is perfect. We all make mistakes, and that's the beauty of it. We make mistakes, and we apologize and seek forgiveness from one another. And God, as in Islam, does not forgive the sins until you ask forgiveness from people. This is beautiful. Um, I don't want to give you an, uh, a lecture, uh, but I thought I would like to acknowledge different sects of Islam here, uh, because um, we didn't really want to give different sects of Islam, different opportunities, because these are intra-faith things. We had a wonderful program on Saturday um, uh, for the Muslims, but Muslim with a capital M. Uh, Muslim uh, with different sects. We have uh, Sunni Muslims, we have Ahmadiyya Muslims, they are with us here. Please, some of you are here around the table scattered. We have quite a few from Beitul Islam. Uh, and then we have also Shia Muslims from Itna Sharia, the Twelvers. We have also Ismaili Muslims. I have uh, my friend here, Kanji, is here, and uh, uh, we have few Ismailis. We have also uh, different groups. So I was asked to give speeches to Ahmadi and Ismaili and Itna Ashari. I said, no, we're all Muslims. We all believe in the Quran. So no need. Uh, if I don't represent you uh, in these ideas, then uh, you have all the stage, you have another four minutes we can add. But I think we all agree uh, on the principles and basics. And, and this gathering is not about, uh, you know, um, trying to learn so you can criticize, but trying to learn so you can help the other to understand you better and you can work with one another, like marriage. 
uh, it's inconceivable that two people get married, just they meet like each other, the way they look, and they say, you know, let's get married. You can't get married like that. You need to know one another. Sometimes it takes years. And it's, sometimes it goes three, four years, people know each other, then they decide to marry. Some of them actually, I know a couple, they had kids and they're going to university, then they decided to get married. But no, uh, it's enough time to understand one another. That happens also between religions and faiths, to understand and learn how to respect. The problem is, and this starts when we upbring the children from an early age to respect the other. And, and the Quran emphasizes on the element of respect is dignity, to make sure that you secure the dignity of a person. And when it comes to dignity, religion is irrelevant. I repeat, when it comes to the dignity of man, religion is irrelevant. Everyone has the right for food, for education, for shelter, to be treated like a human. This has nothing to do with religion. Now, religions just come and remind us, if we were perfect, then we don't need religion. The religions came throughout the time, and prophets were sent to remind us. If you look at Leviticus, you look at Ten Commandments, or the commandments in the Quran, or I'm sh sure other faiths, you will find they are telling us, as we heard earlier, to be good to others, the golden rule. And also, they are telling us that before we expect others to do things, we should do them. I like to quote again Gandhi, as we had two uh, great leaders of the Hindu community. I don't know, probably traffic, they didn't show up, but we wanted to hear from the Hindu community. Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. So the world starts with me first. As I said earlier, at the introduction, I'm entitled to believe in a certain way. I'm entitled to believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as being the last messenger. If you don't want to believe in that, doesn't mean that I have to hate you, I have to force you to believe. Religion becomes fake and a lie and a big lie when it becomes more of structures, not convictions, and I cannot give conviction to another person. If I make someone believe like me, that means I have entered his heart. But God Almighty said to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he told him, you cannot guide whom you choose. You deliver the message. I guide whom I chose. The guidance is given in different ways, in different times by God Almighty to show us and to remind us of those very principles that you don't re really need religion to teach you, but religion comes as a reminder. People who have lived isolated in communities like the Aborigines of Australia and the, 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 the natives of the Americas, they had principles of respect of parents, community, neighbors, truthfulness, Maybe there was a, we always say a prophet was sent to them. How do we know? It's innate in us, like a computer before you install Windows. There is something called DOS that reads the Windows to install it. There is something in us, and I like to quote Noam Chomsky, the great scholar from MIT in the US, famous scholar who really speaks of this very mental language that God created. You'll find that in cognitive science, when they, most of them actually atheists, they don't believe in God, but they do acknowledge, you know, that the humans come with something already in them, and they recognize in one another. And this, these things cannot be expressed with, with a tongue or with a pen. There are things that we share, but we don't know that we share them. So. We try to focus on these things, you know, and we all make mistakes. But uh, as you will see in the questions and the discussions around the table, we would like to hear from you in the discussions, what are the things we can do together without fighting? Maybe, as Imam Patel mentioned earlier, uh, there is a great opportunity. Uh, um, we went to Europe, 
to France, to Spain, to Switzerland, to Belgium, to England, then we found that they are still behind when it comes to interfaith relations. And I just, with all due respect, uh, Reverend Brown, Toronto is way ahead of Mississauga or 905 area when it comes to the interfaith programs. Every week we have a big program. Honestly, this is my assessment. Because we Faith of Life Network, we've been focusing on Toronto way, 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 way ahead. Even way ahead than Calgary, with all due respect, David. Because Toronto, indeed, there was a study by uh, Princeton University, which I was part of, and the, the Toronto is a leading city in the world when it comes to interfaith relations. We've gone beyond sitting and talking about similarities and common grounds. There are projects that we do together, eradicating poverty, building homes for the poor, driving uh, uh, campaigns for uh, blood donor clinics. We do them now with the Jewish community, with the Christian communities, with different groups, with the Hindu, with the Sikh. So we need to do that in Peer region. The Peer region is growing big time. And that's why we said we focus on Peer region because I believe with all due respect, when it comes to interfaith uh, work, not only speeches and dialogues, we're still behind. And I would like to, just to provoke your thoughts on that. So, um, before I finish my uh, share here, I would like to, and the good thing is a few speakers didn't show up, so we have a little bit more time. I will ask Liz Buller, which who is the Senior VP Patient Service, and William Osler, Executive Vice President. Please come to the stage. We have a little uh, presentation for you. And uh, I'll ask Uncle uh, Brother Hamid, He's our treasurer, the treasurer of Faith of Life Network. Um, not last Sunday, the Sunday, the previous one, we pledged as part of Faith of Life Network just to tell you a little bit introduction. And we, we, we have a, the mission statement in the back of the, uh, of the booklet. What we do, we try to focus on what regular mosques and Islamic organizations don't focus on. is promoting interfaith relations and work, social work, Documentary. We have produced to this date 55 documentaries and 300 television shows show in United States and Canada. So this we have done in less than six years. We have an online television and we try to promote these things. We're part of the Trillium Gift of Life Network for uh, organ donation. We are with Canadian Blood Services. We are also, we have uh, adopted one day with Habitat for Humanity. We also try to give scholarship for gifted children, youth who cannot afford. We have started to give it three scholarships a year. We hope to do more. And this will be our first contribution. It's been, if you recall, David and, and Hamid, many years ago, uh, we, we, we decided to open uh, a room in a hospital every year, a minimum, but I'm very pleased to announce uh, that we are, have pledged to sponsor an operating room in William, uh, William Osler Hospital, and we have the honor of having uh, Liz to receive the first check, uh, and we, we, we're pledging to, uh, to uh, do this within the next five years. So Liz, um, can we... Because William Osler Hospital is a hospital, with, they have two hospitals, one in Etobicoke and one in uh, Brampton, the new one. is one of the biggest ones, I believe, in Ontario. She will tell you more about it. But we all go there, and we have to give back. Faith is not about prayers, as we heard earlier. It's about action. Liz, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's my uh, honor and privilege to be here to accept this generous gift. Uh, what an exciting event. Uh, just, I didn't actually know a whole lot about coming in. I tried to go on the website and, and get a little more informed, but just hearing from everybody tonight, it really did resonate about how similar uh, our values are uh, at William Osler. Um, our vision is to design health systems for the global community driven by diversity. And we're very, very committed to understanding our community and relating that back into the care and service that we provide. 
We are the largest community um, health system in the country. Uh, we serve a million people within our Central West Lynn community. Uh, last year we served 600,000 patients. We saw over all, close to 200,000 patients through our emergency department alone. We delivered close to 7,000 brand new babies. It's a very busy place and we serve a hugely diverse community. Um, over 70% of our population, of course, is um, multicultural um, and we have a dedicated diversity department uh, that helps and works with us as we deliver care and services to our patients and families. And to the gentleman who spoke about chaplaincy, uh, we have a very strong spiritual care department and are very committed to ensuring we have spiritual care workers in our organization and are, are very blessed to have several um, spiritual care workers from very uh, different uh, denominations. So it really helps us, we believe, to deliver better care to our community. So I just want to thank you again for the work you're doing, uh, for the education I've gotten this evening uh, in that short window, and for this very generous donation going forward to help us continue to serve the community in a great way. Thank you. I have to acknowledge also uh, uh, Farooqi Bakhsh, he's the uh, president of Human, uh, Human Concern International, but also he's the member of the committee. Uh, Sajad Ibrahim also. Uh, these are the people uh, of uh, friends of William Osler. It's a Muslim friends of William Osler, and they have pledged also uh, one million dollars, of which you can, of which six hundred thousand dollars has been fulfilled just a week ago. So please give them a applause as they have really done. It. Thank you very much, Brother Sajjad, Brother Farooqi, Liz. Speaking of action, I have a very good friend who just joined us a few minutes ago. Uh, very busy man. Sometimes I think I'm the busiest man, but he is very busy. And uh, he, I haven't seen him. He just lost his uh, father a couple months ago and I was at the funeral. And he's, he's really a true, sincere friend of the faith communities in general and specifically of the Muslim community. He spoke when nobody spoke. He stood and he did a lot of justice, in my view, to Islam trying to tell the people, you know, to not to tar if, uh, everyone with the same brush. A man, when you hear him on CFRB 1010 from 4 to 7, Daily Show, you can see the difference between this man and the other hosts of any radio show. A man with vibrancy and a man whom I respect and admire, a good friend. He is actually no other than the great John Tory. God bless him. Chair of Civic Action and Diversity, broadcaster, radio host on CFRB 1010 Daily Show, lawyer, and former leader of the opposition, the PC Party of Ontario, John Tory. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for those kind words. Uh, Imam Salimi, I am uh, I'm enjoying a new life as a broadcaster. It's very liberating, actually. I can tell you that to have a chance to talk on the radio for three hours every day and say anything you want, um, and uh, there's really nobody there to contradict you. And if anybody does contradict you and they aggravate you, you have a mouse in your hand, a computer mouse, and you just have to use about this much energy with your finger, and they're gone. And so um, it is, uh, but I don't do that very often because I, in fact, encourage um, a diversity of opinion because I think it's a one small way in which we can come to understand each other better. I'll give you an example that literally occurred on yesterday's program and unfortunately it's on the subject of, of death and, and cemeteries but you may have seen the story that was in the news about the proposal a man had to build what he called a natural cemetery in Ajax and it was causing some angst among the uh, neighbors that live there because it presently is land that's a golf course. And so I talked about this and said, well, they had an obligation, the people who wanted to put the cemetery there, to satisfy the neighbor. And two people called in, one after the other. And the first was a person who identified himself as a Muslim and said, well, people shouldn't think this is such a big deal that you would simply bury somebody uh, in a shroud as opposed to the more elaborate caskets and whatnot that we use in uh, North America because this is 
done customarily as part of the Muslim faith and in Muslim countries and then done in fact here with people who choose to be buried in that fashion as part of their faith. And I didn't really know that and I thought that was interesting because while well, I've been to some funerals in the, uh, in the Islamic faith, I hadn't been to a burial. The next call that was waiting on the next line was from somebody from the Jewish faith who said, well, you may not know this, and obviously I didn't, uh, that uh, we really believe the same thing, that the bodies are not to be um, otherwise dealt with, it would be a desecration, and therefore in the Jewish faith there are people being buried in the GTA all the time uh, in a very simple manner, and so on. And I thought to myself, uh, you know, how interesting it was that I learned something that day, even though I'd been to a lot of Jewish funerals over the years, I guess I had never gone to a burial or taken notice of what was going on. But I thought to myself, there's so much of this that we have the opportunity to learn about uh, in the GTA because we have substantial communities of all these different faiths uh, that are um, living uh, uh, here uh, and that we just don't know very much about each other. I mean, I make it my business and I have, I've probably been to every kind of place of worship there is in the GTA when I was in politics and many times at that. But this was something I didn't know and if I don't know, um, given the experience I've had and the opportunity I have to learn about these things even in my job, why are other people going to know? And I, I would say this, because I know many of the people in this room, though not all, of course, uh, the whole nature of the meeting is to be a meeting among leaders of different faiths. I will say one thing to my friends in the Muslim community, and I've said these things on the radio so that nothing I say is, in that sense, uh, um, not been said before by me. I believe that uh, part of this, while you might argue about who should reach out first uh, to try and establish better bridges as between the community at large and in particular the Muslim community, I think given what has gone on uh, as the Muslim community has grown in size and in stature and in accomplishment and in contribution to our community, where perhaps there hasn't been the same reaching out uh, based on misperceptions or misunderstanding or lack of information or whatever, that if the rest of the community isn't going to reach out uh, to the Muslim community, then it should reach back uh, to the rest of the community. And a great example of this is what just occurred here not more than two minutes ago, which is a reaching out of a part of this community to the William Osler Hospital um, and doing some fundraising. It's a small example, but you know, it's the one I had made a little note of to myself because if you get involved in the community, I can't think of a community organization I'm involved with many, many, many of them as part of a city building and region building exercise to make life better for people. And the, the issue of poverty was mentioned, for example. But I can't think of any organization, whether it's the William Osler Hospital or any other one that's designed uh, to help build our community stronger, that has too many volunteers. And that if you called up and said you wanted to help, they'd say, I'm sorry, we've got far too many people here, here helping out. Will you please, you'll have to just come another time. It doesn't happen. You wish it did sometimes. But I think if the community here, for example, made an effort to do that and to reach out and to approach these organizations and say you want to get involved, there's no way better than that for people to see what I've said on the radio, which is if you look next to you at the person who works beside you, if you look at the child that your, your children go to school with, if you look at your neighbor next door, you may not actually know that they're people of the Islamic faith because why do people discuss religion all that often? But they are uh, in many cases because it's a very uh, large and growing community within our region. And it maybe now is more important that other than knowing people as a neighbor and as a friend, we know a little bit more about them and about their faith. I work with a man, and I'm not afraid to say this either, and I'll try and conclude because uh, Imam Salimi told me very clearly I was to be six minutes because I stand between you and dinner. This is, a, this is a guy that's just talked for three hours on the radio, so I talk in three hour chunks, but no, never mind, I won't do that to you. But I work with a man on the radio, and you'll know who I'm talking about. And he has convinced me both, or tried to convince me both privately and on the air that in every mosque, without exception, in the GTA region, there are people standing up every Friday at Friday prayers and preaching jihadism and preaching that people should reject, you know, sort of the fundamental tenets of Western society. He said that on the radio, and he said it to me personally because we work at the same radio station. And I said to him, well, you know, I've been to a lot of mosques, uh, uh, many, many mosques in this community, and I've heard people preaching there, and I heard no such thing being preached. And I said, well, I know sometimes it's being preached, and there's things being said in a language that I don't understand. I have enough confidence from the places that I've been uh, to know that that's not going on, and what you say is not true. But I said I have even greater faith than that in one other thing, which is that I know many people who themselves are individuals who uh, believe in and embrace the Islamic faith, and I know I've worked with them, I've worked in the community with them, I've been employed together with them, I have had them as my neighbors, 
And I know I have more faith in them but to believe that they would go to any mosque every single Friday and hear people preaching this sort of thing and be uh, taken in by it in the sense that they'd say, yeah, you know, just because you say so, we're going to buy into this. These are people who are proud, contributing Canadians. And we come from different backgrounds and we have different faiths. I happen to belong to the United Church of Canada, and that's the church that my parents had belonged to and that I got confirmed in when I was 14. I'm not a man who goes to church. I go to other people's churches, it seems, every week. But, you know, it, but, but, it, but nonetheless, uh, to me, that's, as, as, as the Imam said, I mean, when it comes to the fundamental dignity of people or when it comes to how we're going to build a stronger community or how we're going to work together to get things done, whether it's in business or in community building, what does religion matter to all of this? It matters not at all. And so my experience is that the people that I've met in the community, the Muslim community in particular, but all communities are all people who share the same thing. They want a good life for their kids. They want a good life for themselves. They want to be healthy. They want to know that they can go and get some health care if they need it, that they're going to get a good education for their kids. They have some access to opportunity because I think many people came to this country for opportunity to be whatever it is they wanted to be. And that included to practice whatever faith they chose to practice. We've got to spend a lot more time with each other, understanding each other better, and not just sort of saying, well, I think that guy who lives next door to me is this or that, or, you know, I, gee, I wish people understood or knew what I was about better. Go out proactively and, and do this kind of thing, because this is a community that has so much to be proud of, so much to be proud of. Uh, there's so many established leaders and contributors and professionals and so on. So I thank you for having me here, and I thank you for being together to discuss these kinds of things tonight, and I apologize for having gone on at such length, but I, I get going, so I just got in my car right from the radio station and came here, and I never stopped. But uh, I do uh, thank you very much for all that you're doing, and I uh, wish you a very pleasant evening. Thanks very much. Steps our communities can take to strengthen interfaith relations. And the fourth question, which was about a few practical ideas for projects and initiatives together, I think those, those questions were closely tied. So here are some great suggestions. Um, that we should visit different places of worship and volunteer with each other. That we should uh, look at perhaps establishing uh, an emergency response team that's interfaith based, an EMS team and also looking at firefighters because a lot of firefighters are volunteers and so if we could have some sort of a coordinated interfaith uh, firefighter team that might be something to look at in the region. We should visit each other and perhaps set up groups to go visit the sick because visiting the sick is part of all of our faith traditions and often people here especially the elderly may not have family members who are available to them all the time and would be very grateful for company. So visiting the sick in the hospitals, visiting the incarcerated in prisons, people who are alone, people who are lonely. Working together for food banks and food drives, and already a lot of our communities are doing that, but doing more of interfaith coordination around that. Um, and of course, uh, donating blood because it's in all of us to give. So those are some really great suggestions that we received. A uh, few things that people said that they learned that they did not know about from today's discussions. Uh, they learned about burial traditions in different religions. Uh, they learned that, for example, the Baha'i faith, uh, in this case, has no clergy. And in, in fact, even depending on which Muslim sect you're part of, you may or may not have a clergy there. There's somebody who said that they didn't know Unitarianism, Unitarianism existed, so that's a brand new information for some people. Um, and um, for the last question, what can Muslims do? I picked out three that came uh, that came to me. The first was, um, as Muslims, we have to demonstrate willingness to show by example that we're helpful and peaceful. So continue doing good neighborly acts uh, with, with people around us. Uh, we should smile more often. I think everybody could smile more often, so let's smile. <laughs> and uh, what we can do together, actually, in terms of not just helping the Muslim community, but each other, is to work together so that we are united when we're confronted with bias against religion in the media, against any religion, and it's not just Islam, but any religion being vilified in the media. So we should have some sort of coordinated response there. So thank you so much for all of your responses. That was great. And um, I'm going to ask David to come back to the stage and do the closing remarks.
Well, I want to just thank everybody for participating in this. You know, this was, this was a major education for me on so many levels. I, I hope that it was a major education for all of you on many levels. I would like to thank Judy Silek for helping organize the, the uh, bringing together of all the faith components. I'd like to thank Imam Hamid Sneemi for all of the work that he did. I would like to thank all of the speakers, but mostly I would like to thank all of you as participants because this has been a very major movement, I hope, for the entire Peel region. There, there's so much impatience to, to uh, well, as Nakat was just talking about and I, listening to conversations around the room and participating in some of them, the, the impatience to move beyond dialogue. Because dialogue is a wonderful thing. We love to get to know our neighbors, but the best way to get to know your neighbor is to go and help them build a fence or to go and help push somebody out of a ditch. If I want to get to know people in Calgary, I get together and I do things with them for the service of others. And, and these ideas, uh, the, the idea of, of a medical response team, the idea of, of uh, volunteer fire services, the idea of, of uh, working together as interfaith communities in any context, a lot of that is very much out of the box thinking and, and I think you all deserve to be profoundly congratulated for it. So many thanks on behalf of Faith of Life Network, on behalf of all of us who helped organize this. Thank you for coming and I hope it's the beginning of, of something, something bigger. I hope that out of this comes a lot more dialogue and a lot more opportunities for people to get together and do things. Oh, and the one thing Judy Silek told me and I, I uh, forgot to mention it, it just, we always say in Islam that uh, God is the best of planners, that in fact we don't know what's going to happen, we're just along for the ride. Today is actually the Jewish holiday of Shavuot, uh, Pentecost, which is the day that Moses brought down the Ten Commandments from Sinai. And so, and the Ten Commandments are something else that unites all of us as a, as just a, a set of ethical principles that, that can bring us all together in the service of all humanity and all mankind. So thank you very much for coming. Hi. Hi.